Today I've compiled a bunch of my previous videos into the Ultimate NBA Legends video for you guys. Now before it does start, I do have to say, most of these videos were created before the 2023-24 to season began. So just in case an all-star appearance is missing or something is slightly outdated for a current player, that's why. Anyways, I hope you guys enjoy this video and don't forget to subscribe if you like the content. Michael Jordan, LeBron James, Larry Bird, Patrick Ewing, these are all players that come to mind when you think of basketball legends. But how did these guys perform in their first ever NBA games? Let's start today with Michael Jordan because he's thought of by many as the best player to ever touch a basketball. He went on one of the greatest championship runs of all time and we will likely never see a player have the level of postseason success that he did again. He spent 15 years in the league playing for the Chicago Bulls and the Washington Wizards. Before he won 6 NBA titles, made 14 All-Star games, 11 All-NBA teams, 9 All-Defensive teams, 5 MVPs, 6 Finals MVPs, 1 Defensive Player of the Year award, 10 scoring titles, and 3 steals titles, Jordan was the 3rd overall pick of the 1984 NBA Draft by the Chicago Bulls. Despite the greatness that Jordan would achieve later on in his career, he would begin his time in the NBA with a slow start in his debut. In the contest that took place on October 26, 1984 between the Bulls and ironically, the Washington Bullets, Jordan would finish the game scoring 16 points, dishing out 7 assists, and pulling in 6 rebounds while making only 5 of his 16 shots from the field. Although this was not the most efficient or jaw-dropping performance from who many consider to be the GOAT, the Bulls would still win the game by a final score of 109-93. to Jordan would get things back on track throughout the course of the season and would end up winning the Rookie of the Year award, and when it was all said and done, retire as one of the most decorated players in NBA history. Up next is probably the only other argument for the greatest of all time. If somebody doesn't have Jordan as their GOAT, they're likely believing that the best player of all time is LeBron James. James has spent 20 years in the league and is heading into his 21st year in the 2023-24 season. Throughout his lengthy time in the league, he's played for the Cleveland Cavaliers, Miami Heat, and the Los Angeles Lakers. Coming into the league, James was arguably the most hyped up prospect of all time. His high school games were being broadcasted on national television, and many believed that if he didn't finish his career as one of the all-time greats, he would have been thought of as a bust. Despite having arguably the highest bar possible set for him compared to any other player that played in the NBA, James has gone on to crush those expectations that were set for him. Thus far, he's made 19 All-Star appearances, 6 All-Defensive Team appearances, 4 MVPs, 4 NBA titles, 4 Finals MVPs, 19 appearances on the All-NBA team, led the league in scoring once, and led the NBA in assists once, along with many other achievements. After being the first overall pick of the 2003 NBA Draft by the Cleveland Cavaliers, James would begin his career on October 29th, 2003, against the Sacramento Kings. He would finish the contest with an impressive 25 points, 6 rebounds, and 9 assists. Despite this very strong performance, especially taking into account that James was only 18 years old, the Cavs would still lose the game by a final score of 106-92. to After the game, James was quoted as saying, I was able to make a lot of moves I made in high school. I just had to bring a lot more power. They're a lot stronger in the NBA. Most of the moves I used in high school, I used out there. Although James and the Cavs would not be able to secure a win in his debut, he would go on to have one of the greatest and most decorated careers in NBA history and would end up ending the championship drought for the city of Cleveland. Up next was personally one of my favorite players to watch in NBA history. I don't know if they're considered a legend, but I still wanted to throw them on this list. Derrick Rose is set to enter his 15th year in the NBA in the 2023-24 season. Throughout his career, he played for the Chicago Bulls, New York Knicks, Cleveland Cavaliers, Minnesota Timberwolves, Detroit Pistons, and is set to play for the Memphis Grizzlies this season. Rose entered the league as the first overall pick in the 2008 NBA Draft for the Chicago Bulls. His debut to the league would take place on October 28, 2008 in a game against the Milwaukee Bucks. Rose would record 11 points, 9 assists, 3 steals, and 4 rebounds in a very strong showing. Chicago would win the game by a final score of 108-95. to 
After the game, Rose was quoted as saying, it's way more intense. I'm playing in an NBA game in my hometown. I don't know if it can get any better. It can be argued that Rose is still the most talented player to ever suit up for the Bulls since Michael Jordan. He would have one of the best starts to a career that we would ever see. He would quickly become a hero in Chicago and was named as the youngest MVP in the history of the NBA. Along with his MVP win, Rose would also make three All-Star Game appearances, one All-NBA appearance, and won the 2008-2009 Rookie of the Year award. Had it not been for those injuries cutting his elite prime short, Rose could have ended up going down as one of the best point guards to ever play the game of basketball, rather than arguably being the biggest what-if in NBA history. What if I told you that, despite going on to be one of the greatest big men in the history of the league, our next player would come off the bench in his NBA debut? Although he's now best known as being one of the hosts on Inside the NBA, during his playing days, Charles Barkley was one of the top big men of his generation and one of the most talented rebounders of all time. Despite being only 6'6 six six at the power forward position during an era that teams frequently sent out twin tower lineups, Barkley would still dominate on the boards and earn the nickname the Round Mound of Rebound. He was the fifth overall pick of the 1984 NBA Draft by the Philadelphia 76ers. Barkley had absolutely no interest in being drafted by the team and recently went into the lengths he took to avoid being a 76er. Along with this, he went into what kind of shape he was in heading into his NBA debut. In an appearance on the New Heights podcast hosted by Kansas City Chiefs tight end Travis Kelsey and Philadelphia Eagles center Jason Kelsey, Barkley was quoted as saying, I was about 300 pounds in college. The Sixers had brought me in for a visit and the owner says, hey, everybody's concerned about your weight. I think I had like six weeks before the draft and he says, I want you to stop back here the day before the draft. We want you to weigh 285. I get down to about 285 and then my agent says to me, they have a hard cap in the NBA. So if you get drafted by the Sixers, you're going to have to play your first year for $75,000. Shit, I didn't leave college for $75,000. I could have gotten that much in college. So we went on an eating binge. I stop in Philly, I weighed 298 pounds. I leave and I'm thinking, whew, we dodged a bullet. If you go back and look at the tape, there's this look on my face when they said, with the fifth overall pick in the draft, the Philadelphia 76ers select Charles Barkley out of Auburn. I got this look on my face like, what the F? Heading into his rookie season, not happy with his team and extremely out of shape, Barkley would begin the season as a bench player. Despite coming off the bench in his debut, he would still have a rather strong showing, finishing the game with 11 points, 6 rebounds, and 3 assists while shooting 50% from the field. Although Barkley would get off on the wrong foot with the 76ers, things would quickly turn around and he would become one of the top big men in the league. He finished his career in the NBA after 16 seasons in the league. During that time, he played for the 76ers, Phoenix Suns, and Houston Rockets. He would make 11 appearances in the All-Star Game, 11 appearances on the All-NBA team, led the league in rebounds once, and took home one MVP award. Up next is another first ballot Hall of Famer that began his illustrious career coming off the bench. After being the 16th overall pick in the 1984 NBA Draft by the Utah Jazz, John Stockton would begin his NBA career as a bench player. He would only start in two games in his rookie season and had to earn his spot on the team. He made his NBA debut on October 26, 1984 in a game between the Jazz and the Seattle Supersonics. Stockton would finish the contest recording 4 points, 5 assists, and 2 steals in only 17 minutes. Despite Stockton doing a solid job in the minutes that he was given in his debut, the Jazz would still fall short and lose by a final score of 102-94. Although things did not go his way in his debut to the league, Stockton would still go on to have an incredible career and would retire as arguably the most talented pure point guard of all time. He played with the Utah Jazz throughout his entire 19-year career, and in that time he would make 10 appearances in the All-Star Game, 11 appearances on the All-NBA team, 5 appearances on the All-Defensive team, led the league in steals twice, and led the league in assists 9 times. The next legend on our list would show flashes of the generational guard that he would end up becoming in his debut in the NBA. Stephen Curry has gone on to revolutionize the NBA and completely change the way that the sport of basketball is played. 
He began his career as the seventh overall pick in the 2009 NBA Draft by the Golden State Warriors. Curry would start the season as the starting point guard of the team, and in his debut, he would record a very solid 14 points, 7 assists, 4 steals, and 2 rebounds, while shooting a very efficient 7 for 12 from the field. Interestingly, despite going on to be widely regarded as the best three-point shooter of all time and bringing on the three-point revolution, Curry would only shoot one three-pointer in his debut, and he would miss the shot. Curry is heading into his 15th season in the NBA, playing all of them with the Warriors. Thus far, he's made nine All-Star games, nine All-NBA appearances, while winning four NBA titles, one Finals MVP, two MVP awards, and leading the league in scoring twice and steals once. As Curry begins to reach the golden years of his career, he has quickly begun ascending the mighty list of all-time point guards. While most still have Magic Johnson ranked in front of him, the gap becomes more and more narrow each season, and some are beginning to make the argument for Curry to be the best point guard to ever touch an NBA court. Up next is the debut of one of the best big men of his generation. Patrick Ewing is a player that is frequently overlooked when talking about NBA legends. This mostly comes as a result of him and the New York Knicks failing to see much postseason success due to them sharing a conference with Michael Jordan and the Chicago Bulls. Ewing would enter the league as the first overall pick in the 1985 draft by the New York Knicks. He would make his debut on October 26, 1985 in a game between the Knicks and the Philadelphia 76ers. Ewing would begin his NBA career on the wrong foot and would have a very poor showing in his debut. He would finish the game with 18 points, 6 rebounds, 1 assist, 2 steals, and 3 blocks. While this may not sound like a terrible stat line, especially in a player's debut, Ewing would shoot 38.1% from the field and 50% from the free throw line in this game. This mainly came as a result of the 76ers having elite big men in their rotation at the time that consisted of Moses Malone, Charles Barkley, and Bob McAdoo. Although he had a very forgettable debut, Ewing would not let this slow start get to him and would end up having a Hall of Fame caliber career. In his 17 years in the league, Ewing would suit up for the Knicks, Seattle Supersonics, and Orlando Magic. He would retire making 11 appearances in the All-Star Game, 7 appearances on the All-NBA team, a recipient of the 1985-86 Rookie of the Year Award, and a 3-time member of the NBA All-Defensive Team. Up next is an NBA legend that potentially had the greatest debut on the entire list. Before Steph Curry revolutionized the league, Magic Johnson was the consensus pick as the greatest point guard to ever play in the NBA. He came into the league more than ready to play at the professional level, and he proved that in his NBA debut. Johnson's debut would take place on October 12, 1979, against the San Diego Clippers. He would have an incredible all-around game, finishing the contest with 26 points, 8 rebounds, 4 assists, 1 steal, and 4 blocks, while shooting a very solid 47.6% from the field. Lakers would narrowly win this game by a final score of 103-102. to One of the most notable moments from the game came after Kareem Abdul-Jabbar hit the game-winning shot. Johnson would rush to arguably the most talented big man of all time and embrace him with a bear hug. Abdul-Jabbar would then tell Johnson to calm down as there were still 81 games left in the season. Johnson would seemingly take this to heart and would come up huge for the Lakers in their finals run. With Kareem injured in Game 6 of the series, Johnson, who mainly served as a team starting point guard, would suit up at the center position. Despite going against an elite big man rotation that the Philadelphia 76ers featured, Johnson would put up an all-time performance in the closeout game, recording 42 points, 15 rebounds, 7 assists, 3 steals, and 1 block while shooting 60.9% from the field. Along with the title, Finals MVP, he would also retire with 12 All-Star appearances, 3 MVP awards, 10 appearances on the All-NBA team, 4 additional titles, 2 additional Finals MVPs, 4 assist titles, and 2 steals titles. It could be argued that no player came into the league as prepared to make the transition into the professional level as Johnson, but even more impressive is that he continued to develop his game and take strides in being arguably the most talented player to ever play the point guard position. What if I told you the final debut on our list from an NBA legend 
should have come one year earlier, but he made one of the most historic franchises in history and the league as a whole wait an entire year. Larry Bird is one of the few players from his era that could have had an even better career if he played today. This is no knock on Bird's career as he retired as one of the top two players of his era, but his elite three-point shooting skill set would make him a force to be reckoned with in today's league. Bird was drafted as the sixth overall pick in the 1978 NBA Draft. Despite this, he would not make his league debut until the 1979-80 season. This came as a result of him returning to play his senior season at Indiana State even after being drafted. One of the main reasons that he made the decision came as a result of a promise that he made to his mother. An excerpt from Wish It Lasted Forever, Life with the Larry Bird Celtics is quoted as saying, He'd promised his mom that he'd get his degree, and he had to complete student teaching obligations to fulfill graduation requirements. But after Bird got his degree, and it was finally time for him to make his much-anticipated debut into the league, he was more than ready to play at the professional level. He finished the game with 14 points, 10 rebounds, and 5 assists, while shooting 50% from the field. Interestingly, Bird taking the floor for the first time would not be the only historic thing about his debut. His Celtics teammate Chris Ford made the first three-point shot in NBA history. Bird would continue to dominate the league through his rookie season and the remainder of his career. After 13 seasons with the Celtics, Bird would retire with 12 All-Star appearances, 10 All-NBA appearances, 3 All-Defensive Team appearances, won the 1979 Rookie of the Year award, 3 MVP awards, 3 NBA titles, and 2 Finals MVP awards. For a long stretch before players like LeBron would enter the league, Bird was widely regarded as the most talented small forward to ever play the game. Kobe Bryant played just over six minutes in his first ever NBA game, and a lot of you guys were asking me why he wasn't included in NBA Legends First Games Part 1. Well, we're including him in Part 2, and we're also going to go over some other legends such as Bill Russell, Shaquille O'Neal, and a couple more. So sit back, relax, and enjoy. All right, so we are going to start it off here with Kobe Bryant, who would retire as one of the most highly decorated players in NBA history after spending his 20-year career all playing for the Los Angeles Lakers. But some people don't know, he was actually drafted by the Charlotte Hornets with a 13th overall pick in the 1996 NBA draft and then immediately traded to the Lakers for Vladi Divac. Now, it was clear that the Hornets had no intentions of keeping Kobe on the roster despite using a lottery pick to add him to the team. When recounting his interactions with the team's front office, Bryant was quoted as saying, We couldn't have used you anyways. Now seeing how things played out, this would end up being one of the most boneheaded decisions made by a GM in NBA history, but at the time, this didn't really seem like a terrible move for the Hornets. Coming into the league, scouts were in love with Bryant's freakish athleticism and scoring ability, but they were very skeptical about selecting a player that was coming straight out of high school. Around this era in the NBA, players skipping out on college going straight into the NBA didn't have an elite track record of having great NBA careers, but players like Bryant and Kevin Garnett paved the way for players like LeBron James and Dwight Howard to be the first overall picks in their respective drafts despite not playing at the collegiate level. Leading up to the draft, scouts were quoted as saying that Bryant has questionable ball handling skills, may not be ready for the rigors of the NBA lifestyle, and does not have the body for it right now does not have a true position, played all five in high school and didn't perfect any one of the five, and is very good at all five, but not great. Now, despite the player that we know Kobe would end up being, it would take some time for him to truly adjust to playing at the professional level. In fact, he would not even see the floor in the first game of his rookie year. This was not even as a result of an injury. At the time, the Lakers were a contending team, and as a result of this, they did not have the time to attempt to develop talent through the regular season that they did not believe could have an immediate impact on winning championships. However, he would make his NBA debut in the second game of the season against the Minnesota Timberwolves. The contest took place on November 3rd, 1996. Bryant would only see 6 minutes and 22 seconds of playing time and would not get a chance to put his talents on display in this short window of time. Despite finishing his career as one of the greatest scorers in the history of the game, he would finish the game with only one shot attempt that he missed. Along with failing to record a single point, Brian would also fail to record an assist, only pulled in one rebound, and recorded one block. Despite his struggles, the Lakers would still win the game by a final score of 91-85. to 
this trend of barely seeing the floor would continue through Bryant's first few seasons in the league. In an interview after he had gone on to establish himself as a star, Kobe was quoted as saying, Losing to the Celtics in 08 was tough, but before that, at the beginning of the journey, I was not playing. So coming in as a rookie and saying, man, if I knew the shit was going to be like this, I would have went to school. I felt like my coach Del Harris at the time was trying to make sure he didn't show favoritism to the young kid. And as a result, he swung completely in the opposite direction and doing things that weren't really fair. I mean, not playing. My first two or three years were a nightmare. Kobe would only start in a combined seven games in his first two seasons in the league, but he would work his way up to becoming a full-time starter for the Lakers in the 1998-99 season, and the team would never look back. As we now know today, despite his slow start and the time it would take to adjust to the professional level, Bryant would go on to carry the Lakers for the better part of two decades and he would become the greatest player in franchise history. Up next is an NBA legend that was more than ready to perform at an NBA level and put on a very impressive showing in his debut in the league. Hakeem Olajuwon was the first overall pick in the 1984 NBA draft. Now it's important to note that Olajuwon was one of the two players in the 1984 draft class to be selected right in front of Michael Jordan. Even with Jordan going on to become arguably the greatest player in the history of the game, Many still do not fault the Rockets for going with Olajuwon with the first overall selection. While he rarely sees his name come up in the GOAT conversation, Akeem still retired as one of the most talented and versatile big men that the game has ever seen. He would spend 18 years in the league playing for the Rockets and the Toronto Raptors, but coming into the league, scouts were in love with his athletic ability and speed at the center position, his endless bag in the post, and his once-in-a-generation talent on the defensive end. Even Olajuwon's glaring weaknesses were ignored as a result of his era. He had an elite skill set of a traditional center around this era. He was a force to be reckoned with on both sides of the ball in the paint. However, as did almost every center around this era, he struggled as a passer. Despite this, the Rockets still saw him as the clear choice for the top pick in the 1984 NBA draft, and they quickly inserted him into their starting rotation. Akeem would make his NBA debut as the starting center for the Rockets, taking on the Dallas Mavericks on October 27, 1984. Lajuan would turn heads in his debut and finish the game with a very impressive 24 points, 9 rebounds, 1 assist, and 1 block while shooting 61.1% from the field and 40% from the free throw line. Houston would end up getting the best of their in-state opponents by a final score of 121 to 111. This would end up being a sign of things to come for Akeem. He came into the league ready to make an immediate impact on whatever team drafted him and he would go on to do just that. By the time that his NBA career came to a close, he would be known as the most talented player to ever put on a Houston Rockets uniform, and arguably the best big man of all time. Next up, we're going to cover another NBA legend that ended up playing for the Lakers, but in the beginning of his career, ended up on the Milwaukee Bucks. Kareem Abdul-Jabbar is in contention for some people to be one of the greatest players to ever touch an NBA court. He was the first overall pick in the 1969 NBA draft by the Milwaukee Bucks. He would go on to play 20 years in the league for the Bucks and the Los Angeles Lakers. Coming into the league, Abdul-Jabbar was an undeniable talent. Despite his immense size, he was still an extremely athletic player for his era. Along with this, he was an amazing scorer around the basket, one of the best rebounders of his era, and one of the top interior defenders in the history of the game. He proved during his time in college at UCLA that he was more than capable as a leader, as he was the driving force of the Bruins' three national titles in his three seasons there. Abdul-Jabbar was a no-brainer for the first overall pick, and he would prove the front office of the Bucks correct as early as his NBA debut. Kareem's first game in the league would take place on October 18, 1969 against the Detroit Pistons. Abdul-Jabbar would shockingly play all 48 minutes, not sitting out for a single second. In his 48 minutes, he would record 29 points, 12 rebounds, and 6 assists while shooting 44.4% from the field and 62.5% from the free throw line. It's important to note that at this time in the NBA, steals and blocks were not recorded, sadly. 
As we now know just how elite Abdul-Jabbar was on the defensive end, the stat line from his debut likely would have came out to be even more impressive if the defensive stats would have been kept track of. The Bucks would end up winning this game by a score of 119 to 110. It was clear from his debut that Abdul-Jabbar would be leaned on to be the leader of the Bucks. Despite it being his first game at the professional level, he would be the only player on Milwaukee's roster to not sit the bench at any point. He would also shoot seven more shots than Flynn Robinson, finish the contest with the second most shots attempted on the Bucks roster this game. While he would not spend the entirety of his career on the Bucks, he would still lead the team to a great deal of success, and would also be a very strong contributing force in Los Angeles during his time with the Lakers. At the time of his retirement, he would have the most points recorded in NBA history, along with being one of the strongest rebounders and interior defenders that the game had ever seen. While this next NBA legend didn't have the strongest debut in the league, he would go on to be arguably the most dominant player in NBA history and would even earn the respect from one of his opponents in his debut. Shaquille O'Neal is widely regarded as one of the most dominant players that the league has ever seen. His unique combination of size and athleticism made him almost impossible to stop in the paint. He was the first overall pick in the 1992 NBA draft, selected by the Orlando Magic. Coming into the league, scouts were in love with Shaq's game and build. Despite his massive height and frame, O'Neal was still very agile and athletic for his size. He was able to defend the paint at an elite level, and his size made him almost impossible to stop when he backed down his opponents. His debut to the NBA would take place on November 6, 1992 in a matchup between the Magic and the Miami Heat. Shaq was relatively passive in his debut and was not as dominant in the paint as he would be later on in his career, but O'Neal would still finish the game with 12 points, 18 rebounds, 2 assists, 1 steal, and 3 blocks while shooting 50% from the field and 57.1% from the free throw line. Magic would go on to win this game by a final score of 110-100. to while O'Neal didn't really dominate the paint in this performance, he would still be a force to be reckoned with on the boards in his league debut. By himself, Shaq would account for half of the total rebounds that the Magic pulled in that night. Although this was a rather mundane game from O'Neal on the offensive end, his opponents would still be taken back by his talent and would give him some very high praise after the game. In his interview after the contest, Heat center Ronnie Cycli was quoted as saying, When he leaned on me, it was like a house falling on you. Up next is the debut of the greatest winner that the league has ever seen. Bill Russell holds the record for most NBA titles in the history of the league with 11. Now this is most likely a record that will never be broken and as a result of this, he's established himself as the greatest winner in league history. Russell will be selected by the St. Louis Hawks with the second overall pick of the 1956 NBA Draft. However, he would be dealt to the Boston Celtics before he would even play a single game with the Hawks. This would go on to be one of the worst draft day trades in league history as the Hawks would only receive Ed McCauley and Cliff Hagen. Now, there are actually multiple theories on why Russell was traded from the Hawks to the Celtics. The most popular one being that the city of St. Louis at the time was extremely racist and they didn't want to build a franchise around an African-American player. Now, this was a home run for the Celtics on the opposite side of things, and their head coach at the time, Red Auerbach, knew his organization had pulled off a heist. When talking about Russell before he even played in his first NBA game, Auerbach was quoted as saying, he will change basketball. While many pushed back on this comment at the time, Auerbach would once again be proven correct, and it would just be another example of why he was one of the best basketball minds during the era. Coming into the league, many were in love with what Russell brought to the table as a player. He was an incredible leader, rebounder, interior defender, and a selfless player. His leadership skills would be put on full display when he would spend time both playing and coaching the Celtics. Along with this, his dedication to fighting for rebounds and getting 50-50 balls would cause his teammates to play a team-oriented style of basketball as well. This would be a huge contributing factor to the success that the Celtics would see during Russell's time with the team. The debut would take place on December 22, 1956 against the St. Louis Hawks. This would be the team that dealt Russell on draft night, and he came into this contest with a lot to prove and a chip on his shoulder. Despite this factor and the extremely strong career that he would go on to have, Russell would struggle in his debut. He finished the game with 6 points, 16 rebounds, and 1 assist while shooting 27.3% from the field and missing all 4 of his attempts from the free throw line. 
While Russell was never much of a scorer and was a much more talented rebounder, his atrocious shooting percentage this night caused some concern for the Celtics. However, they would still come out of the contest with a 95-93 victory. Despite the slow start on the scoring end, Russell would go on to become a much more efficient scorer near the basket as his career continued. Along with this, even in his debut to the league, he would establish himself as a force to be reckoned with on the boards. Boston would go on to win the NBA Finals in Russell's rookie year, and he put on a very strong showing in the postseason, along with making some necessary adjustments to his game from his debut. In the playoffs, Russell would go on to average 13.9 points, an incredible 24.4 rebounds, and 3.2 assists per game, while shooting a still inefficient 36.5% from the field and a much improved 50.8% from the free throw line. Today we're going to go over how NBA legends performed in their final games. Now it's only right that we started off with Michael Jordan as he's widely regarded as the best basketball player of all time. Currently, LeBron is the only player giving him a run for his money. So as a result of the dominant career that Jordan had put together, by the time he played his final game, he was more than deserving of a proper send-off. The entire league held the highest respect for Jordan as he had dominated each and every franchise that he didn't play for during his peak. While he made almost all of his career-defining moments as a member of the Chicago Bulls, he would finish his career with the Washington Wizards. In an interview with the owner of the team, Ted Leonsis, he recalled a conversation that he had with Jordan saying, I said, tell me what you're interested in. He said, I want to win more championships. I want equity. I want to run the basketball operations. Jordan would get equity in the team, being a partial owner before having to sell his stake in the organization after he joined the roster as a player. In his final game in the NBA, Jordan and the Wizards would face off against the Philadelphia 76ers on April 16th, 2003. MJ would finish the game with 15 points, 4 rebounds, and 4 assists, while shooting 40% from the field. To make things worse for Jordan, the Wizards would also lose the game by a final score of 107-87. to Despite Jordan being far from the elite scorer that he was in his prime, obviously, his impact on the game and the respect that he had earned during his illustrious career was put on full display. With 1.44 left in the game, the 76ers guard Eric Snow fouled MJ, so he would have a chance to finish his career with two free throws. When asked about the foul, Snow was quoted as saying, Coach told me to foul him, get him to the line to get some points, and get him out of there. Despite the game taking place in Philadelphia, a city that is well known for their fans not showing the most grace, Jordan would still receive a standing ovation from the crowd after sinking both free throws. After the game, Jordan was quoted as saying, the Philly people did a great job. They gave me the biggest inspiration in a sense. Obviously, they wanted to see me make a couple of baskets and then come off. That was very, very respectful, and I had a good time. Now, I guess it hits me that I'm not going to be in a uniform anymore. That's not a terrible feeling. It's something that I've come to grips with, and it's time. This is the final retirement. Jordan would retire as one of the most highly decorated players in the history of the game. He won the 1984-85 Rookie of the Year award, made 14 All-Star appearances, led the league in scoring 10 times, led the NBA in steals 3 times, won 6 NBA titles, took home 6 Finals MVPs, made 11 All-NBA appearances, 9 All-Defensive Team appearances, won 5 MVP awards, 1 Defensive Player of the Year award, and was a first ballot Hall of Famer being inducted in 2009. Up next is the player that came the closest to replicating Michael Jordan in almost every way possible. Rest in peace to Kobe Bryant. He is likely the closest thing that NBA fans will ever see to Michael Jordan. It was almost eerie watching side-by-side -side comparisons of the players doing almost the same move frame by frame. Despite his game being heavily inspired by Jordan, Bryant was still able to make it out of MJ's shadow and make a name for himself as the second best shooting guard of all time. Bryant's mentality and dedication to the game led to him being one of the top players to ever suit up in an NBA game. He bounced back from countless injuries that would leave many players as a shell of what they once were. And despite all the wear and tear on his body, by his final game in the NBA, Bryant put on the best final performance in the history of the game. Throughout the course of his final season, Bryant earned the privilege of getting the closest thing to a send-off tour that the league has ever seen. 
His Los Angeles Lakers were struggling to find the talent to surround him with, and it was clear that they did not have a shot of making the postseason. As a result of this, this allowed Bryant to have the offense run through him and put on a show in his final season in the league. This came to a head in his final game of his career, and it was in the Staples Center. Shortly before the game began, their opponents, the Utah Jazz, were eliminated from playoff contention. This allowed both sides to ensure that Bryant would receive the proper send-off that he had earned through his 20-year run of dominance in the NBA. Heading into the game, Bryant's friend Shaquille O'Neal challenged him to cap off his career with a 50-point outburst. But with Kobe being the elite competitor that he was, he would eclipse the 50-point mark and keep going. He would finish the game with 60 points, 4 rebounds, and 4 assists while shooting 44% from the field and 28.6% from 3. The Lakers would win this game by a final score of 101-96. to After the game, O'Neal spoke on the challenge that he issued Kobe prior to the game, saying, I challenged him to get 50, and the mother effer got 60. This 60-point outburst would give Bryant the record for the most points in a final game of a player's career, smashing John Havlicek's previous record at 29 points. Bryant would retire making 18 appearances in the All-Star game, leading the league in scoring twice, winning five NBA titles, taking home two finals MVPs, making 15 appearances on the All-NBA team, 12 appearances on the All-Defensive team, and winning one MVP before being inducted to the Hall of Fame in 2021. The next player on our list was one of Kobe's biggest rivals in the Western Conference through the late 2000s and early 2010s. Dirk Nowitzki retired as one of the greatest power forwards to ever play the game of basketball. He spent all 21 of his years in the NBA as a member of the Dallas Mavericks. When his run with the team finally came to an end, it was a very sad moment for the franchise. Dirk's final game would come on April 10th, 2019 against the San Antonio Spurs. Unlike the Utah Jazz in Kobe Bryant's final game, the Spurs were still in playoff contention in the final game of the year, and as a result of this, they could not afford to give Dirk the final send-off that he deserved. Despite this, he still ended the contest with a very respectable 20 points, 10 rebounds, and 1 assist, while shooting 38.1% from the field and 33.3% from 3. While this wasn't the most efficient scoring night of his Hall of Fame caliber career, this was still a very impressive showing from a 40-year-old player. After the game, Nowitzki got high praise from arguably the greatest head coach of all time, Greg Popovich. After the game, Coach Pop was quoted as saying, Everybody, players, fans, coaches, and staff got to witness history watching him play his last game. He played a fine game, which was great. It's not surprising. He was having a lot of fun tonight. I was really happy for him. Despite losing the game by a final score of 105-94, to Dirk was still in very high spirits after the game. Despite Nowitzki playing for the opposing team, San Antonio still played a 1 minute and 30 second tribute video going over some of the best moments of Dirk's incredible 21 year career. When asked about that moment, he said, The first 20-30 seconds, I was kind of holding it. I was like, that's sweet. And then it just kind of all came out. I'm not sure why. Not only did they show highlights from my career, but they showed highlights from me beating up on the Spurs, which was even more incredible. Nowitzki retired as one of the best to ever play his position and one of the most widely loved players in the history of the game. At the time of his retirement, he made 12 All-NBA teams, 14 All-Star appearances, one MVP, and led the Mavericks to arguably the most impressive NBA Finals win of all time over the Miami Heat, where Dirk would be named as the Finals MVP. Up next is another player that would retire as the most beloved player in the history of the team that he retired for. There are very few players that were able to connect with the city as well as Dwayne Wade did with Miami. He was so beloved by Heat fans and the city as a whole that he would even have a county named after him. While the name would eventually be changed back, for a short time, Miami-Dade County Commissioners would unanimously pass the notion to change the name of their county to Miami-Wade County. Wade would spend 15 of his 16 seasons in the league playing at least 21 games with the organization. Despite the tight bond that he held with the city of Miami, Wade would play his final game in the NBA on the road against the Brooklyn Nets. He would finish the contest with an incredible 25-point, 11-rebound, and 10-assist triple-double performance. 
while he did this on a rather inefficient shooting night going 35.7% from the field and 23.1% from three, this was still an amazing showing from the then 37 year old Wade. After the game, he was quoted as saying, my thoughts are all over the place. As I sit here, I think about the moment that my agent came to the table in New York in 2003 and told me the Heat were about to pick me at five. It was a numb feeling, similar to what I'm feeling right now. I heard the ovation, I heard the love, I appreciated it then and I more than appreciate it now. I'm sitting here the most thankful person in this state to play my last game on this floor. I'm not crying on the outside right now because I'm so joyous. This is going to take some getting used to. Tuning in, watching this organization, watching my teammates play out here, and I'm not there. It's definitely going to take me a while to get used to. Wade would finish his career widely regarded as one of the best shooting guards to ever play the game. He would retire with 13 All-Star appearances, 3 NBA titles, 1 Finals MVP, 8 All-NBA appearances, appearances on the all defensive team and was inducted into the hall of fame in 2023 what if i told you that the next player on our list would play the final game of his career in a game seven of the nba finals it cannot be argued that bill russell is the greatest winner in the history of the nba while he didn't finish his career with a spotless record in the nba finals like michael jordan's 6-0 run Russell's 11 NBA titles is a record that will never come close to being touched again. The final game of his career would come in a very fitting matchup in the NBA Finals against the Los Angeles Lakers. Throughout his career, Russell had a handful of run-ins with the Lakers in the Finals, and he would retire with a record of 6-0 against the team in the Finals, averaging an incredible 17.6 points and 24.7 rebounds per game in the 42 finals games of the two franchises played against each other. Russell's final game as a player in the NBA would come in game seven of the 1969 NBA finals with the series being tied three to three and the Lakers having the home court advantage. The odds were stacked up against Boston, but despite this, Russell would still do his best to put up a respectable performance. Although shooting not the greatest 28.6% from the field, he ended with six points, 21 rebounds and six assists in the closeout game. The Celtics would narrowly escape in a 108 to 106 win, and Russell would call it a career with an 11th NBA title under his belt. After the game, he kept things very simple and was quoted as saying, we played well together. While this was not the most profound statement from one of the greatest big men of all time, nothing more true could have been said about him and the Celtics core around this time. Russell and his teammates from the Celtics hold the top six spots in terms of players with the most championships. Despite the Lakers having incredible rosters around this time, they were not able to put things together and win when it mattered like Boston did. While Russell's name doesn't come up as frequently as it should in discussions of all-time greats, the sacrifices he made to win will never go unnoticed as another player probably will never come close to winning the amount of titles as him. At the time of his retirement, Russell was named to 12 All-Star teams, 11 All-NBA teams, one All-Defensive team, won five MVP awards, led the league in rebounding four times, took home 11 titles, and was inducted into the Hall of Fame twice, once as a player in 1975 and once as a coach in 2021. The next NBA legend's last game came from one of the greatest shooters of all time. Reggie Miller was arguably the greatest shooter of his generation and one of the top marksmen that the game has ever seen. His final game came in the second round of the playoffs against the Detroit Pistons on May 19th, 2005. This would come in the same season that the notorious Malice at the Palace incident would take place. Miller would have an outstanding performance in his final game in the NBA, finishing the contest with 27 points, 2 rebounds, and 2 assists, while shooting a remarkable 68.8% from the field and 50% from three. If it had not been for the suspensions from the Malice at the Palace leaving Miller without much of a supporting cast, the Indiana Pacers could have ended up winning the series, but they would lose in game six by a final score of 88 to 79. Despite the game not going his way, Miller would still get a standing ovation from the same hometown fans that his teammates were in an all out brawl with in the regular season. This speaks volumes to the caliber of player that Miller was and the respect that he earned throughout his time in the league. 
He would retire with five All-Star appearances, three All-NBA appearances, and was inducted in the Hall of Fame in 2012 after spending his entire 18-year career with the Pacers. Have you ever been curious about how Carmelo Anthony, Ray Allen, Paul Pierce, Tim Duncan, or Kevin Garnett even played in their final NBA games? Well, that's exactly what we're going over today. NBA Legends Last Games Part 2. Tim Duncan is arguably the most talented power forward in the history of the NBA. He was selected with the first overall pick of the 1997 NBA Draft by the San Antonio Spurs, where he would eventually spend the entirety of his 19-year NBA career. In his 19 years with the Spurs, Duncan would win the 1997-98 Rookie of the Year Award, made 15 All-Star appearances, 15 appearances on the All-Defensive Team, 15 appearances on the All-NBA Team, won 5 NBA titles, 3 Finals MVP awards, and 2 MVP awards. Despite ending his career as one of the most decorated players in history, Duncan is often overlooked when fans and analysts make their list of the best players of all time. This mainly comes as a result of his personality and style of play. Duncan was a very reserved player both on and off the court. Along with this, he was an extremely team-first player and he rarely made non-fundamental plays. As a result of Duncan not being a particularly exciting player to watch for some or having an outgoing personality off the court, he is oftentimes forgot about. This reserved personality would come to a forefront when Duncan was tasked with how he would go on about announcing his retirement. In his final couple of seasons in the league, Duncan was nearing his 40s and it was clear that he was getting too old for his body to hold up through the entirety of a season. Along with this, with the pace of the game continuing to be ramped up as Duncan continued to age, it was very clear that he was nearing the time for retirement. Despite this, with the Spurs having a very solid roster and looking to make a deep playoff run, Duncan did not want to take any attention away from the team's main goal of an NBA title with him announcing his upcoming departure from the league. His final game would come in game number 6 of the Western Conference Semifinals against the Oklahoma City Thunder on May 12, 2016. Despite his age and the miles that he had put on his body at this point, Duncan still had an extremely strong showing in his final outing. He finished the game with 19 points and 5 rebounds while shooting 50% from the field. However, this would still not be enough for the Spurs to get the best of the Thunder in this matchup and they would lose by a final score of 99-113. to after the game was over, it was clear that Duncan was disappointed with the final result in what would end up being the final game of his NBA career. He was quoted as saying, One of those nights at the wrong time. We actually played somewhat solid in the second half, but it was too little, too late. Reporters were curious if Duncan would suit up in the following season. Even then, he did not give any hints that he would retire, saying, I'll get to that after I get out of here and figure life out. Never one for the spotlight, Duncan would take onto the Spurs team website to pen his retirement letter to his teammates, the staff, and the fans, saying, If asked to write this script for my career 19 years ago, there is no way I would have been able to dream up this journey. I stand here at the end of this ride and look back in awe of what I've experienced. The wins and losses will be remembered. What I'll remember most are the people, the fans inside the arena and out, the staff and coaches who pushed me and held me together the teammates, and even opponents who will be lifelong friends, sharing my ups and downs with family and close friends, and most importantly, the snapshots of my kids growing up and reveling in watching dad work. This is what I will cherish most. Thank you to the city of San Antonio for the love and support over these years. Thank you to the fans all over the world. Much love always, Tim. This is arguably the most fitting way that Duncan could have possibly made his exit from the league. He was never a player that was forced into or really desired to be in the spotlight. Despite being one of the most talented players of the 2000s, he always kept the topic of discussion on the team and the success of the Spurs rather than focusing on his countless individual achievements. While he was well deserving of a send-off tour similar to Kobe Bryant's, this was never the route that Duncan went for. To this day, he is still extremely close with the Spurs organization and the team has asked him to come in and work with their most recent first overall pick, Victor Weminyama. Although he's over half a decade removed from suiting up for San Antonio, Duncan is still dedicated to doing whatever he can to improve the organization. Now, in my personal opinion, this is exactly what you want in a player for your basketball organization and Tim Duncan is a very solid role model for the younger kids. 
What if I told you that the next NBA legend would also have their retirement send off overshadowed in a playoff loss? Paul Pierce was one of the most talented scorers in the 2000s and was a crucial part of the Boston Celtics Big Three that won the 2008 NBA Finals. Pierce was the 10th overall pick of the 1998 NBA Draft to the Boston Celtics. In his 19 years in the league, he would play for Boston, the Brooklyn Nets, Washington Wizards, and Los Angeles Clippers. Throughout his career, he was named to the All-Star Game 10 times, the All-NBA Team 4 times, won one NBA title, and one Finals MVP award. Pierce would make it clear that the 2016-17 season would be his last in the league, holding a press conference before the year kicked off, saying, I've given this game all I've had all my life, and just like any difficult decision that you ever got to make in your life, I think you really got to be at peace with yourself to make a decision like this. I realize it that uh, it's time to move on from the game of basketball. It's a tougher decision I ever had to make in my life, but uh, this is it, my final season. Pierce was still a very useful role player for the Clippers in his final season in the league. While he didn't see too much time on the court through the regular season, he would see a major spike in his minutes through the tail end of Los Angeles' first round series against the Utah Jazz. His final game would come on April 30th, 2017 in Game 7 of the series. Pierce would finish the contest with 6 points, 3 rebounds, 1 assist, and 1 steal while shooting 50% from the field, 33.3% from 3. Despite Pierce playing his role well in this game, it would not be enough for the Clippers to advance to the second round and reach their ultimate goal of winning a championship. They would lose Game 7 by a final score of 91-104. While Pierce didn't end up getting a farewell tour, he still went out as a solid player even at 39 years old. Up next on our list is another member from the Celtics Big 3 that would end up in the Hall of Fame. Kevin Garnett is one of the most talented power forwards that the game has ever seen. He was a revolutionary player at the position as he was able to do a little bit of everything while most players at the position at this time did not have much of an outside game or any ball handling skills. Garnett was the 5th overall pick of the 1995 NBA Draft to the Minnesota Timberwolves. Throughout his 21 years in the league, he suited up for Minnesota, the Boston Celtics, and the Brooklyn Nets. He retired with 15 appearances in the All-Star Game, 9 appearances on the All-NBA Team, 12 appearances on the All-Defensive Team, 1 NBA Title, 1 MVP Award, 1 Defensive Player of the Year Award, and led the league in rebounds 4 times. The final game that Garnett would play was in the 45th game of the Timberwolves 2015-16 season on January 25th, 2016 against the Memphis Grizzlies. Garnett would not play a major role in this game, finishing the contest with only 2 points while shooting 50% from the field. Despite there being 37 games left in the regular season for the Timberwolves, Garnett would be benched for the remainder of the season. As a result of this, he was unable to have a send-off tour or even address the fans of the team that drafted him. He would go on to serve as a veteran presence for the young Timberwolves core for the remainder of his time with the team and mentor players like Carl Anthony Towns. At the beginning of the 2016-17 season, the Timberwolves would then buy out the remainder of Garnett's contract and he would retire from the league. The player that Garnett took under his wing during his second stint in Minnesota, Cat, was quoted as saying, KG is one of a kind. He's not one of a kind once every other day or week. He's one of a kind every single day. That's what makes him special. Something small like tipping a ball out of bounds on defense will happen, and I'll clap. But KG is just standing up, going crazy like someone just got dunked on with the best poster of all time. I think everyone needs his energy. It pushes us to be great. While Garnett didn't end up going out to the fanfare that he had earned due to his elite play for the vast majority of his career, Garnett was still able to pass on some of his wisdom and insights to the next generation. Next NBA legend on our list is the third and final member of Boston's Big Three that went on to win the 2008 NBA Finals. Before Steph Curry and Klay Thompson came around to revolutionize the three-point shot, there was a clear answer on who was the greatest three-point shooter of all time, a player being Ray Allen. Allen was one of the top marksmen that the game had ever seen, and one of the few players that might have had a better career if they played in today's game, considering how far the three-point shot has come along. Allen entered the league as the fifth overall pick of the 1996 NBA Draft by the Minnesota Timberwolves. Had the Timberwolves held onto this pick, they would have had the chance to pair Allen and Garnett long before they would join Paul Pierce on the Boston Celtics. 
However, they traded him to the Milwaukee Bucks for Stephon Marbury in a deal that would leave Allen fighting to get into Bucks fans' good graces before he even suited up for a game. When asked about the moment, he was quoted as saying, I go in the back and I'm having a conversation with people from Minnesota, their local news station. Within five minutes into those conversations, somebody from the NBA removes me and says that I've been traded to Milwaukee. Everybody in Milwaukee at the time is booing the trade. The media is asking me all these questions and letting me know that they're booing the trade. I was so depressed on a day that I felt was supposed to be the happiest day of my life. I felt so frustrated, confused, and disappointed. Despite starting off on the wrong foot in Milwaukee, Allen would quickly establish himself as a star and one of the premier talents that the league had to offer at the time. Along with the Bucks, Allen would also suit up for the Seattle Supersonics, Boston Celtics, and Miami Heat. He would retire after 18 years in the league with 10 appearances in the All-Star Game, 2 appearances on the All-NBA team, and 2 NBA titles. His final game in the NBA would come in Game 5 of the 2014 NBA Finals. The game would take place on June 15, 2014, where Allen and the Heat would take on the San Antonio Spurs in a closeout game. Allen would struggle through the contest, finishing the game with 5 points, 5 rebounds, 2 assists, and 1 steal while shooting a very out of character 12.5% from the field and 33.3% from 3. This effort didn't really do too much in keeping the Heat's finals hopes alive, however, Allen was by no means the player to blame for the loss. Miami would lose by a final score of 87 to 104. With the champion being crowned at the end of this game, Allen did not get much of a chance or a spotlight that he deserved to properly announce his retirement from the league. However, he wrote a very touching letter in the Players Tribune titles, Letter to My Younger Self, where he covers his struggles having to constantly move growing up, the highs and lows of his basketball career, and finally, what he took away from the entire journey. Some interesting excerpts came at the beginning when he said, Dear 13-year-old Ray, When you get off the school bus tomorrow, you're going to be in a whole new world. This is nothing new. Every time your father gets stationed at a new Air Force base, you have to say goodbye to your friends and start a new life. It's the same routine once every three years or so. New school, new culture, new faces. How do I sum up nearly two decades in the NBA? What do you really need to know? What's truly important? You'll get to play against your heroes. Michael Jordan and Clyde Drexler. You'll play alongside Hall of Famers, Kevin Garnett, Paul Pierce, LeBron James, Dwayne Wade. You'll put up more than 26,000 shots in your career. Almost six out of 10 won't even go in. I told you this game was a son of a bitch. The letter then concludes with a very touching message. Now the most important question in your life isn't, who am I supposed to be? Or even, what do I have to do to win another championship? It's, daddy, Guess what happened in math class today? That's the reward that awaits you at the end of the journey. Go to the court, stay at the court, get your work in, young fella. Most people will never really get to know the real you. The next NBA legend was almost forced into retirement once, but was able to get a proper send-off after clawing his way back into the league. Carmelo Anthony has arguably had more ups and downs in his career than any other player in NBA history at his status. Anthony was the third overall pick of the 2003 NBA Draft to the Denver Nuggets. In his 19 years in the league, he's played for the Nuggets, New York Knicks, Oklahoma City Thunder, Houston Rockets, Portland Trailblazers, and Los Angeles Lakers. At the time of his retirement, he was named to 10 All-Star teams, 6 All-NBA teams, and led the league in scoring in the 2012-13 season. Anthony is the most recent retiree on this list, announcing his departure from the league in the 2023 postseason. However, he was almost forced to call it quits almost half a decade earlier. After leaving the Knicks, Melo was a part of two teams that were contending for a title, in the Thunder and the Rockets. As a member of the Thunder, he was the third piece of a big three consisting of himself, Russell Westbrook, and Paul George, while on the Rockets, he played alongside Chris Paul and James Harden. Anthony would end up being the scapegoat for each of these rosters failing, and a majority of front offices around the league saw him as a past his prime shot chucker. But he would be given a final chance to prove that he still belonged in the NBA by the Portland Trailblazers, and he would do what he had to to keep his career alive. After two seasons with the Trailblazers, Anthony would spend the final year of his NBA career with the Lakers. His final game would come on April 5th, 2022 against the Phoenix Suns. Unfortunately, he would have a very tough showing in this matchup, finishing the game with 10 points, 6 rebounds, 2 assists, 2 steals, and 1 block, while shooting a very inefficient 30% from the field 
and 33.3% from three. LA would lose this game by a final score of 110 to 121. Anthony would sit out the remaining three games of the regular season, and the Lakers would not make the postseason after an injury-ridden season. Anthony still held out hope through the 2022-23 regular season that he would get another shot to play for a contending team and pick up an NBA title before his retirement. However, that call would never come, and he would be forced to announce his retirement. Mello would post a video on Twitter with the caption, Thank you, hashtag stay mellow. The video would feature clips of his highlights throughout the years while Anthony gave his send-off speech. He was quoted as saying, I remember the days when I had nothing, just a ball on the court and a dream of something more. But basketball was my outlet. My purpose was strong, my communities, the cities I represented were proud, and the fans that supported me along the way. I am forever grateful for those people and places as they made me Carmelo Anthony. But now the time has come for me to say goodbye to the court where I made my name, to the game that gave me purpose and pride. I am excited about what the future holds for me. When people ask me what I believe my legacy is, it's not my feats on the court that come to mind or the awards or praise, because my story has always been more than basketball. My legacy, my son, it's in you. I will forever continue through you because the time has come for you to carry this torch. It's clear that Kai and Anthony is primed to make a name for himself in the league when the time comes. While it's going to be a tall task to become the next Carmelo Anthony, it is clear that his father has all the confidence in the world in his son to make it happen. From Kobe Bryant's 81-point outburst against the Toronto Raptors to Bill Russell grabbing 40 rebounds in a single game, today we're going to be going over some of the best games of all time from NBA legends. Wilt Chamberlain was one of the most dominant players of all time. He was a generational athlete and had the advantage of playing in an era where competition was far less skilled than the average player was that we see today. Chamberlain was the third overall pick of the 1959 NBA draft by the Philadelphia Warriors. He spent 14 years in the league and in that time made 13 All-Star games, 10 All-NBA teams, two All-Defensive teams, four MVPs, two NBA titles, one finals MVP, won the 1959-60 Rookie of the Year award, led the league in assists once, rebounds 11 times, and scoring 7 times. He would be inducted into the Hall of Fame in 1979. Chamberlain's elite skill set put him head and shoulders above the rest of the league at the time. In particular, his scoring ability out of the post, paired with his height of 7'1", made him almost impossible to stop. This would be put on full display on March 2nd, 1962, in a game between the Philadelphia Warriors and the New York Knicks. Chamberlain would finish the game with an NBA record setting 100 points. This is a record that still stands today and one that is likely to never be broken again. He finished the game shooting 36 for 63 from the field and 28 for 32 from the free throw line. To make this performance even more impressive, Chamberlain accomplished this insurmountable feat without the luxury of having a three-point line. However, while he was not able to shoot any three-pointers in this game, Chamberlain did have both teams aiding in him reaching this historic milestone. Once Wilt's point total reached a certain mark, his teammates would begin fouling the Knicks, so Chamberlain would have more time to go to work on the offensive side of the ball. Along with this, when it became clear that the Knicks would not have a chance of winning the game, they would begin to foul Chamberlain so he would be able to earn his points from the free throw line. This is the reason behind him finishing the contest with 32 free throw attempts. Up next is another mind-blowing scoring performance from one of the best scorers that the game has ever seen. Kobe Bryant was one of the best scorers to ever suit up in an NBA game. At the time of his retirement, he ranked third on the all-time scorers list. He was the 13th pick in the 1996 NBA draft by the Charlotte Hornets. In his 20 years in the league, he would make the All-Star game 18 times the All-NBA team 15 times, the All-Defensive team 12 times. Along with this, he would win five NBA titles, two Finals MVPs, one MVP award, and led the league in scoring twice. On January 22, 2006, Bryant would have arguably the most awe-inspiring performance of his entire career. The Los Angeles Lakers would take on the Toronto Raptors, and Kobe would end up torching the entire Toronto roster. He would finish the game with an incredible 81 points while shooting 28 for 46 from the field, 7 for 13 from 3, and 18 for 20 from the free throw line. Along with this amazing scoring performance, 
Bryant would also grab six rebounds and dish out two assists. While Bryant didn't end up breaking the 100 point mark set by Wilt Chamberlain and did have a three point line, many still consider this to be more impressive of a scoring outburst. While the 81 point mark will be much more achievable to surpass than Wilt's 100 point game, there is still a chance that we might never see another player in history break this record. Arguably the most impressive thing about this performance is the circumstances that he did it in. The Lakers finished the game with only 122 points meaning that Bryant accounted for over 66% of the team's total points. Along with this, this era of the NBA was heavily focused on an isolation style of play on the offensive end, and also an emphasis on deep two-point shots. As we know now, due to the revolution and implementation of analytics in the league, this is one of the most inefficient shots in the game. Despite this, Bryant proved why he is widely regarded as one of the best scorers of all time and had one of the most impressive games in the history of the NBA. The next insane single game performance from an NBA legend on this list comes from another Los Angeles Lakers player on the biggest stage of them all. Elgin Baylor was one of the best scorers of his generation. He was drafted actually two times by the Minneapolis Lakers, once in 1956 and once in 1958. In his 14 years in the league, he would make the All-Star game 11 times, the All-NBA team 10 times, and won the 1958-59 Rookie of the Year award. On April 14, 1962, Los Angeles Lakers would take on the Boston Celtics in Game 5 of the 1962 NBA Finals. Baylor would finish the game with a remarkable 61 points and 22 rebounds. Arguably the most impressive thing about this performance is that Baylor was able to achieve this remarkable points total while being guarded by Tom Snatch Sanders. At the time, Sanders was considered to be one of the top defenders in the entire NBA. Along with this, the Celtics had one of the best big men and interior defenders of all time on their roster for this game in Bill Russell. Even if Baylor was able to shake past Sanders, he was still forced to try and get a shot off around Russell. The Lakers won this game by a final score of 126 to 121. After the game, Baylor was quoted as saying, All I remember is that we won the game. I never thought about how many points I had. After Baylor's generational performance, even his opponents could not help from giving him his flowers. Sanders was quoted as saying, Elgin was just a machine in that game. At the time of this performance, it was the most points that were ever scored in a postseason game until Michael Jordan would break the record with his 63-point outburst against the Boston Celtics in the 1986 playoffs. Up next is another incredible single-game performance, this time coming from one of Baylor's opponents in his 61-point scoring outburst, one of the greatest big men that the NBA has ever seen. Bill Russell is one of the greatest players to ever touch an NBA floor. He was the second overall pick in the 1956 NBA draft by the St. Louis Hawks and then immediately traded to the Boston Celtics for Ed McCauley and Cliff Hagan. In his 13 seasons in the league, Russell would make the All-Star game 12 times, the All-NBA team 11 times, one All-Defensive team, won five MVPs, 11 NBA titles, and led the league in rebounding four times. Russell was one of the greatest rebounders of all time. At the time of his retirement, he averaged 22.5 rebounds per game while only averaging 15.1 points per game. Despite this, he would nearly double his career averages in both statistical categories in Game 7 of the 1962 NBA Finals. The game would be between Russell's Boston Celtics and the Los Angeles Lakers. Russell and the Celtics had their backs up against the wall in a winner-go-home situation on the biggest stage in the league. Russell would show up when the game mattered most and have arguably the most impressive performance in a Game 7 in the Finals in NBA history. He finished the game with a remarkable 30 points and 40 rebounds. The Celtics would go on to win the game and Russell would win the fourth of his eventual 11 NBA titles. The next single game performance on this list is arguably the most impressive game that a player has ever had. While David Robinson came nowhere close to eclipsing Wilt's 100 points or even Kobe's 81, his performance on February 17, 1994 against the Detroit Pistons is arguably the most impressive single game outburst on this list. Robinson was the first overall pick of the 1987 NBA draft by the San Antonio Spurs. In his 14 years in the league, he would make the All-Star game 10 times, the All-NBA team 10 times, the All-Defensive team 8 times, won one MVP, one Defensive Player of the Year award, the 1989-90 Rookie of the Year award, two NBA titles, led the league in scoring once, 
rebounding once, and blocks once. Despite not having much of an outside game and playing the role of a traditional center, Robinson was still very versatile for a big man, especially in his era. He would put this on full display against the Pistons where he finished the game with a remarkable 34 points, 10 rebounds, 10 assists, and 10 blocks. This would be the fourth quadruple double in NBA history, the other three coming from Nate Thurman, Alvin Robertson, and Hakeem Olajuwon. Since Robinson achieved this historic feat, no player in the NBA has been able to replicate it, and it could be a very long time before the historic quadruple double ever occurs again. The next player on this list was arguably the most dominant player in the history of the NBA, and he would come very close to becoming the fifth player of all time to record a quadruple double. Shaquille O'Neal has a strong case for being the most dominant player of all time. He stood at 7'1 and weighed in at 325 pounds. Despite his immense size, Shaq was still very athletic for a big man in his era. He was selected with the first overall pick of the 1992 NBA Draft by the Orlando Magic. In his 19 years in the league, he was named to the All-Star Game 15 times, the All-NBA Team 14 times, the All-Defensive Team 3 times, won 4 NBA titles, 3 Finals MVPs, 1 MVP, the 1992-93 Rookie of the Year award, and led the league in scoring twice. Despite O'Neal not being much of a passer in his career, averaging only 2.5 assists per game, he would nearly become the only player in NBA history to record a quadruple double in the NBA Finals. On June 8, 2001, the Los Angeles Lakers would take on the Philadelphia 76ers in Game 2 of the 2001 NBA Finals. He would finish the game with an astounding 28 points, 20 rebounds, 9 assists, and 8 blocks. Shaq would come painfully close to achieving the historic quadruple double, coming just 1 assist and 2 blocks short. This game would come right after the Lakers took a shocking loss in Game 1 of the series. It was clear that O'Neal was not going to let that happen again, and the Lakers would win the series and in turn the NBA title in just 5 games. Despite coming just short of the quadruple double, this would still be one of the strongest single game performances in the history of the final. The next player on our list would carry his team past one of the strongest rosters in the league at the time. LeBron James is set to enter his 21st year in the league in the 2023-24 season. He was the first overall pick in the 2003 NBA draft by the Cleveland Cavaliers. Throughout the first two decades of his professional career, James has made 19 all-star teams, 19 All-NBA teams, 6 All-Defensive teams, won 4 NBA titles, 4 Finals MVPs, 4 MVPs, the 2003-2004 Rookie of the Year award, led the league in scoring once, and assist once. Arguably the strongest single game performance of his illustrious postseason career came on May 31st, 2007 in Game 6 between the Cleveland Cavaliers and Detroit Pistons. James would finish the game with a remarkable 48 points, 9 rebounds, 7 assists, and 2 steals. This would set a career high for him at the time in single game postseason scoring. Arguably the most impressive thing about the entire performance is that James scored the final 25 points that the Cavaliers scored in the game and 29 of the team's final 30 points. He would also nearly score half of the team's total points in the game with the second leading scorer on the team being Zadronis Ilgalskis scoring just 16 points. After the historic performance, James was quoted as saying, I'm banged up, I'm winded, I'm fatigued, I've got all day tomorrow. It's going to be tough to get some rest when you got a crazy two-year-old running around the house. So hopefully I can take him to one of his grandma's house. When asked about the performance itself, he said, why should I be surprised? I was making a lot of great moves. They are definitely a great defensive team, but I was determined to attack. I was able to will my team to victory. This is definitely a big win, one of the biggest wins in Cavaliers franchise history. For me and my teammates, it's definitely the biggest win. We have a goal. We can't dwell on this when we have another game on Saturday. We've got to do our best to win that ball game and get where we wanted to be all year. This was such an awe-inspiring game that even James's opponents on the Pistons were forced to give him credit for torching them. Pistons then head coach Flip Saunders said, We tried to trap him and get it out of his hands, but he attacked. We'll definitely have to do something different next time. Pistons point guard Chauncey Billis was quoted as saying, We threw everything we had at him. We just couldn't stop him. It's frustrating. He put on an unbelievable display out there. It's probably the best I have seen against us ever in the playoffs. 
James was able to pull out another win to take down the Pistons and advance to the 2007 NBA Finals, take on the San Antonio Spurs. But the lack of help around James was put on full display and the Cavs would lose the series in just four games. What if I told you that one of the best games from arguably the best point guard of all time came in a game that he played the center position? Magic Johnson was a generational talent and one of the best players to ever spend time in the NBA. He was the first overall pick in the 1979 NBA draft by the Los Angeles Lakers. Through his 13 years in the NBA, Johnson made 12 All-Star appearances, 10 All-NBA appearances, won 5 NBA titles, 3 Finals MVPs, 3 MVPs, led the league in assists 4 times, and steals 2 times. Despite being regarded by some as the best point guard of all time, arguably the most impressive single game performance from Johnson's illustrious career came in one of the few games that he played the center position. Potentially the most impressive fact about this game is that Johnson accomplished what he did as a rookie. In Game 6 of the 1980 NBA Finals, Johnson and the Los Angeles Lakers took on the Philadelphia 76ers. At the time, Philadelphia would have Daryl Dawkins, an elite player in his own right at the center position. With the Lakers missing Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, they turned to their rookie point guard to fill in for him. While most point guards would be unable to play the center spot, Johnson was standing at 6'9", so he had the size to make it work while still being considerably smaller than Dawkins. Johnson would finish the game with a remarkable 42 points, 15 rebounds, 7 assists, 3 steals, and 1 block. The Lakers would win the game by a final score of 123-107, to and Johnson would be named as the Finals MVP. In an appearance on the All The Smoke podcast, Johnson recounted the historic performance and what led up to it, saying, Everybody's head is down because Kareem can't play. I said, so what if Kareem can't play? We're still going to win. And they looked at me like, rookie, go sit down. We can't beat Philadelphia without Kareem. So I said, I got to do something to get these guys going. I asked the flight attendant if I can go on the plane first. So I went and sat in Kareem's seats. And as every Laker came by, I said, never fear, magic is here. The unmatched confidence from Johnson led to one of the greatest single game performances in NBA history, and if he wouldn't have stepped up and filled in for Kareem, there is a strong chance that the Lakers would have ended up blowing the 3-2 series lead that they held. Since you guys seem to really enjoy the NBA Legends Best Games video, I figured I'd make another one. So here is part two, which includes Michael Jordan, Steph Curry, and many more. Now we are going to start today off by talking about Michael Jordan, who has a strong case of being both the best scorer and overall player of all time. He entered the league as the third overall pick of the 1984 NBA Draft, selected by the Chicago Bulls. And throughout his 15-year NBA career, he spent time playing for the Bulls and the Washington Wizards. Over the decade and a half that he spent in the league, Jordan won the 1984-85 Rookie of the Year award, was named to the All-Star Game 14 times, the All-NBA Team 11 times, the All-Defensive Team 9 times, won the 1987-88 Defensive Player of the Year award, the MVP award 5 times, 6 NBA titles, 6 NBA Finals MVP awards, made the NBA 75th Anniversary Team, led the league in scoring 10 times, led the league in steals 3 times, and was inducted into the Hall of Fame in 2009. The best game of Jordan's career would come in a regular season matchup against the Cleveland Cavaliers that took place on March 28, 1990. Cleveland is a franchise that Jordan would go on to terrorize over the better part of his career, and this game was no different. He finished the contest with 69 points, 18 rebounds, 6 assists, 4 steals, and a block while shooting 62.2% from the field, 33.3% from 3, and 91.3% from the free throw line. Jordan and the Bulls would win this game by a final score of 117 to 113. With the Bulls only managing to put up 117 total points, even with the game going into overtime, it makes it even more impressive that Jordan was able to put up 69 points individually, accounting for roughly 59% of the team's total points. Shockingly, this is also MJ's personal favorite game of his entire career. After his retirement, when asked about the historic night, he was quoted as saying, I think the game I had against Cleveland when I had 69, that was strictly off of anger and disappointment. Earlier in the first quarter, when I think I got a hard foul from Hot Rod and I, you know, I fell the wrong way and I was really in pain, and the whole crowd cheered. And that right there pissed me off because they were more in tune to winning than someone's health. And that kind of got me fired up. That's when I went crazy. 
I didn't think about being tired because I wanted to win the game. I've been in that situation where I've scored a lot of points and we lost, and I didn't want that to happen. So I kept pushing myself, kept talking to myself, saying, don't stop, don't stop, keep going. You feel better about the effort when you win. Now, up next, we have another scoring outburst, but this time coming from the greatest three-point shooter of all time. Stephen Curry has gone on to prove himself as the greatest shooter of all time, and he's revolutionized the game with the three-point shot. And without him, there's a strong chance that basketball would not be played the way it is today. He entered the league as the seventh overall pick of the 2009 NBA draft, selected by the Golden State Warriors, where he spent the entirety of his 14-year career thus far. And in that time, he's been named to nine All-Star games, the All-NBA team nine times, won two MVP awards, four NBA titles, one Finals MVP, one Western Conference Finals MVP, made the NBA 75th anniversary team, led the league in scoring twice, and finished one season as the league's steals champion. Now there's certainly a number of Steph Curry's games that I could have had on this list today, but I selected the game against the New Orleans Pelicans that took place on October 31st, 2015. Curry shot lights out in this game, finishing the contest with 53 points, 4 rebounds, 9 assists, and 4 steals, while shooting 63% from the field, 57.1% from 3, and 100% from the free throw line. Curry and the Warriors would win the game in dominant fashion, with the final score being 134 to 120 in favor of Golden State. After the game, Curry was quoted as saying, Everybody's having fun. I've always had confidence. You just get better as a player and try to take it to another level. So that's what I'm trying to do this year. I'm blessed to be healthy. I'm feeling pretty energetic, pretty strong out there on the floor, playing free, just having fun. So usually good things happen when all that comes together. With Anthony Davis being on the wrong side of history in that certain game, this would not be the case in this next contest we're going to talk about where he had one of the most impressive performances of all time. When he's healthy and playing at 100%, Anthony Davis is one of the most talented big men that we've ever seen play the game. He entered the league as the first overall pick of the 2012 NBA Draft, selected by the New Orleans Hornets. Throughout his 11 years in the league, he spent time playing for the Hornets, who are also you know, switched over to the Pelicans and the Los Angeles Lakers. Over this time, he's been named to the All-Star Game eight times, the All-NBA team four times, the All-Defensive team four times, won one NBA title, made the NBA 75th anniversary team, and led the league in blocks three times. The best game of his entire career would come in a regular season contest between the Pelicans and the Detroit Pistons that took place on February 21st, 2016. Davis would dominate this game, finishing the contest with 59 points, 20 rebounds, 4 assists, and 1 block, while shooting 70.6% from the field, 100% from 3, and 90% from the free throw line. After the game, Davis said, That was a lot of fun because the rim looked so big that it felt like everything I shot was going to go in. I wasn't keeping track of my point total, but the guys were telling me at the timeouts. They wanted me to get 60. Despite falling just one point short of that 60 point milestone, this was still a historic night from Davis that would result in a Pelicans win by a final score of 111 to 106. Up next on our list, we have potentially the best game of one of the most influential big men that the game has ever seen. Kareem Abdul-Jabbar is one of the most decorated players in NBA history. He joined the league as the first overall pick of the 1969 NBA draft selected by the Milwaukee Bucks. Throughout his 20 years in the league, he spent time playing for the Bucks and the Los Angeles Lakers. Over that time, he won the 1969-70 Rookie of the Year Award, was named to the All-Star Game 19 times, made the All-NBA Team 15 times, the All-Defensive Team 11 times, won 6 NBA titles, 2 Finals MVP Awards, 6 MVP Awards, made the NBA 75th Anniversary Team, led the league in scoring twice, finished the 1975-76 season as the league's rebound champion and led the NBA in blocks four times. Now, As a result of Abdul-Jabbar playing in an earlier era, a good chunk of his games wouldn't even receive a game score as the stat was not implemented until the 1977-78 season. However, the best game of his career once the stat would begin being recorded came in a contest between the Lakers and the Chicago Bulls that took place on December 18, 1979. He would finish the game with a very impressive 39 points, 16 rebounds, 9 assists, 2 steals, and 5 blocks, while shooting 65.2% from the field and 81.8% from the free throw line. The Lakers would win this game by a final score of 129-118. to 118. 
Kareem exemplified in this game that he had a much more diverse skill set than he sometimes gets credited for and was dominating this contest in almost every aspect of the game. Now, the following NBA legend on this list would have to have the game of his life for his team to stand a chance in this game, and he would show up in a massive way. Throughout his prime, Allen Iverson would struggle to play for organizations that could build a quality team around his skill set, and as a result of this, he would oftentimes find himself having little to no help on the offensive end and have to dominate the game in terms of scoring for his team to even have a shot. He would join the league as the first overall pick of the 1996 NBA draft selected by the Philadelphia 76ers. Along with the Sixers, Iverson would also play for the Denver Nuggets, Detroit Pistons, and Memphis Grizzlies throughout his 14 years in the league. In that time, he won the 1996-97 Rookie of the Year award, made 11 appearances in the All-Star Game, 7 appearances on the All-NBA team, won the 2000-2001 MVP award, was named to the NBA 75th anniversary team, led the league in scoring four seasons, was named as the league's steals champion in three seasons, and was inducted into the Hall of Fame in 2016. Iverson was an elite scorer, and when he was on a hot streak, no one in the league had a chance of stopping him. The Orlando Magic would be on the wrong side of an offensive onslaught from Iverson in what would be the best game of his career. This game took place on February 12, 2005. Iverson would finish the contest with an incredible 60 points, four rebounds, six assists, five steals, and one block while shooting 47.2% from the field, 40% from three, and 88.9% from the free throw line. Despite his historic performance, Iverson and the 76ers would only win the game by a final score of 112 to 99. Shockingly, this next NBA legend's best game would be the only one on this list to come in the postseason. Despite finishing his career without an NBA title, the best game of Patrick Ewing's Hall of Fame caliber career would come in the playoffs. He entered the league as the first overall pick of the 1985 NBA draft, selected by the New York Knicks. In his 17 years in the league, Ewing would spend time playing for the Knicks, Seattle Supersonics, and Orlando Magic. And in that time, he won the 1985-86 Rookie of the Year Award, was named to the All-Star Game 11 times, the All-NBA Team 7 times, the All-Defensive Team 3 times, named to the NBA 75th Anniversary Team, and was inducted into the Hall of Fame in 2008. The best game of his career would take place on May 4th, 1990 in Game 4 of the Knicks' first round series against the Boston Celtics. Ewing would lead the Knicks to a dominant victory, controlling the game on both ends of the floor. He finished the contest with 44 points, 13 rebounds, 5 assists, 7 steals and 2 blocks, while shooting 75% from the field and 88.9% from the free throw line. Ewing and the Knicks would win the game by a final score of 135 to 108 and would end up winning the series in 5 games. Kevin Garnett was one of the most talented players of the 2000s. He broke the mold of a traditional big man at the time, and if it hadn't been for players like him, there's no telling what the state of the power forward and center positions would be like to this day. He entered the league as the fifth overall pick of the 1995 NBA draft selected by the Minnesota Timberwolves. Along with the Timberwolves, Garnett would also play for the Boston Celtics and Brooklyn Nets throughout his 21 years in the league. In that time, he was named to the All-Star Game 15 times, the All-NBA Team 9 times, the All-Defensive Team 12 times, won the 2003-2004 MVP Award, one NBA title, the 2007-2008 Defensive Player of the Year Award, led the league in rebounds four times, made the NBA 75th Anniversary Team, and was inducted into the Hall of Fame in 2020. The best game of Garnett's career would come on January 4th, 2005 in a regular season contest between the Timberwolves and the Phoenix Suns. Garnett would finish this game with an astounding 47 points, 17 rebounds, 4 assists, and 2 steals, while shooting 67.9% from the field and 81.8% from the free throw line. Despite his amazing night in almost every facet of the game, it would not be enough for the Timberwolves to win this game, and they were taken down by a final score of 122 to 115. While the next game on our list may not be the best of this legend's career in terms of game score, it was too elite of a performance to not be included on this list. Larry Bird is one of the pillars of the NBA. Him and Magic Johnson controlled an entire era of the league, and without him, there's a strong chance that the NBA would not be where it is today. He joined the league as the sixth overall pick of the 1978 NBA draft selected by the Boston Celtics, where he would spend the entirety of his 13-year NBA career. Throughout his 13 years in the league, Bird won the 1979-80 Rookie of the Year award, was named to the All-Star Game 12 times, the All-NBA team 10 times, the All-Defensive team 3 times, won 3 NBA titles, 
two NBA Finals MVP awards, three MVP awards, and the NBA 75th anniversary team and was inducted into the Hall of Fame in 1998. While this game may not be statistically the best game of his career, his most impressive performance would come on February 14, 1986 in a regular season contest between the Celtics and the Portland Trailblazers. Bird finished this game with 47 points, 14 rebounds, 11 assists, 1 steal, and 2 blocks, while shooting 61.8% from the field, 100% from 3, and 66.7% from the free throw line. While this is a very solid performance, it was far from the best of Bird's career. In fact, he would have a better game score than this game in two other contests in the 1985-86 season. However, the kicker with this game against the Trailblazers is that Bird was able to achieve the near 50-point triple-double while only shooting with his offhand, which was his left. The reason he did this was to apparently quote-unquote save his right hand for the Lakers. Now if you ask me, that's some insane disrespect to the Blazers in this game. Up next is a very impressive performance from one of the best power forwards of all time. Along with Kevin Garnett and Tim Duncan, Dirk Nowitzki has a strong case to be considered one of the best power forwards of all time. He would join the league as the ninth overall pick of the 1998 NBA Draft, selected by the Milwaukee Bucks and then traded to the Dallas Mavericks, where he would spend the entirety of his 21-year NBA career. Over those 21 years, Dirk was named to the All-Star Game 14 times, the All-NBA Team 12 times, won the 2011 NBA Finals where he took home the Finals MVP Award, the 2006-07 MVP Award, and was named to the NBA 75th Anniversary Team. The best game of his career would come on December 2, 2004 in a regular season matchup between the Mavericks and the Houston Rockets. Nowitzki would finish the night with 53 points, 16 rebounds, 2 assists, three steals and four blocks, while shooting 46.9% from the field, 40% from three, and 95.5% from the free throw line. Despite Dirk's historic night, the Mavericks would only narrowly win this game by a final score of 113 to 106. The next legend on our list is one that Dirk got the best of in the 2011 NBA Finals. Dwayne Wade is probably one of the top five shooting guards to ever play the position. He joined the league as the 5th overall pick of the 2003 NBA Draft selected by the Miami Heat. During his 16 years in the league, Wade played for the Heat, Chicago Bulls, and Cleveland Cavaliers. In that time, he was named to the All-Star Game 13 times, the All-NBA Team 8 times, the All-Defensive Team 3 times, won 3 NBA titles, one NBA Finals MVP award, led the league in scoring once, and was named to the NBA 75th Anniversary Team. The best game of his career would come in a game between the Heat and the Chicago Bulls that would take place on March 9, 2009. Wade would finish the night with an impressive 48 points, 6 rebounds, 12 assists, 4 steals, and 3 blocks, while shooting 71.4% from the field, 83.3% from the 3, and 72.2% from the free throw line. Despite the strong showing from Wade, the Heat would only win the game by a final score of 130 to 127. Now, the final NBA legend that we're going to cover today solidified himself as one of the top three point shooters of all time. Reggie Miller was the inspiration to Ray Allen, and during his prime, no one could keep up with Miller behind the arc. He would join the league as the 11th overall pick of the 1987 NBA draft, selected by the Indiana Pacers, where he would spend the entirety of his 18 year NBA career. In that time, he was named to the All Star game five times the All-NBA team three times, made the NBA 75th anniversary team, and was inducted into the Hall of Fame in 2012. His best performance in the NBA would take place on November 28, 1992 in a game between the Pacers and the Charlotte Hornets. Miller would light up the scoreboard, finishing the night with 57 points, 5 rebounds, 8 assists, and 1 steal, while shooting 55.2% from the field, 36.4% from three, and 91.3% from the free throw line. Miller would lead the Pacers to a dominant 134-122 to victory. Now, if you guys haven't seen part one of this series, make sure to check it out right here. And also, if you're not already subscribed, hit that subscribe button.